Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Oh, I was abused. I was treated like a dog. Nobody should have been treated the way I was. And I finally understood that, I mean, that was true. I wasn't treated right. And I had a reason to sit around and be mad and angry and have a chip on my shoulder and all kinds of stuff. But I had no right to because Jesus died, so I didn't have to. Emotional habits. We could probably spend a little bit of time there, right? Some emotional habits that are harmful are self-pity. Hmm. Hmm. Depression. Excessive discouragement or grief. Letting our circumstances determine our mood. <laughs> A quick temper, being touchy and easily offended, taking action based on emotion without being realistic and giving in any thought to what we're doing. If our plans don't work, we feel sorry for ourselves. I used to spend a lot of time feeling sorry for myself, and anytime God would try to deal with me about it, I'd say, well, you know, I was abused. And I was treated like a dog. Nobody should have been treated the way I was. And I finally understood that, I mean, that was true. I wasn't treated right. And I had a reason to sit around and be mad and angry and have a chip on my shoulder and all kinds of stuff. But I had no right to because Jesus died, so I didn't have to. Come on, let's get that again now. It's not about what you have a reason to do. I'm saying that because Jesus poured his blood out for us, and sacrificed his life and suffered the way that he did on the cross and went to hell in our place and, and thankfully he was resurrected and is now at the right hand of the Father. But everything that he, can you imagine what it was like for God to come down here and get in a fleshly body? That would be like me agreeing to go be an ant. <laughs> and even that is not a good example. He did so much for us. So much for us. And we don't have to sit around and feel sorry for ourselves. Yeah, you may have a reason, but you don't have a right to because he paid too high of a price for you not to have to. Amen. So I guess I might as well say this. If you do it, it's not because you have to, it's because you want to. <laughs> I'm going to find a few people that are smiling at me and, well, you, I know how it goes. Well, you, just, you don't know what I'm going through. You, you know what my life's been like. I'm just telling you that self-pity is not going to help you. It's not going to change anything. It doesn't impress God. It doesn't move God. Oh, the devil loves it. Oh, yeah. Every time you spend a day in self-pity, hell has a party. They, they, they love it. You know, you need to get to the point where when the devil invites you to a pity party, you say, no thanks, been there, done that, not wasting another day of my life sitting somewhere feeling sorry for myself. And, you know, I know there's lots of wonderful people watching by TV, and, you know, you have all kinds of terrible situations in your life. I'm thinking right now there's probably somebody that's very sick in bed, and maybe you've got a real, you know, a real serious disease or you've been in a real serious accident and, and you're you know there's that temptation to feel sorry for yourself because of the condition you're in let me tell you something God wants you to have joy in every circumstance that you're in and this thing that you're going through this too will pass and you'll come out of it so don't waste the days that you have feeling sorry for yourself Use it to study the Word of God and to read good books and, and to watch good things on TV. Just use it as a time to get so full of the Word that when you can get up and walk again, devil, the hell is going to be mad that you even got out of bed. Okay, here's the story. I know a woman who was very sweet and pleasant all of her life. She loved doing things for other people. But at the age of 87, she could no longer live alone and had to become a resident in a nursing home. The nursing home was one of the best in the city, and the staff was superior. She was taken good care of, had good meals. Her children paid all the bills and visited her often. 
But she let the emotion of self-pity begin to rule in her life. She grumbled about and found, found fault with everything. She frequently said that people just didn't understand how hard it was for her to give up all her stuff and have to rely on other people. The problem became so severe that the people dreaded visiting her. And the staff cringed each time she pressed the button to turn on the little red flashing light outside of her room. Thinking about the negatives in her life eventually made her angry and depressed. And sadly, her doctors had to keep giving her more and more anxiety and nerve medicine to keep her calm enough for people to even handle her. I truly believe if she had been positive and thankful, her experience could have been a joy. She was so self-absorbed that she refused to even go out of her room to visit with any of the other residents or go to the dining room chapel or to any other function the nursing home offered. To me, this is a good example of how habitually displaying wrong emotions can literally ruin our lives and ruin all of our relationships. She did have a choice. And whatever situation that you're in today or whatever situation I ever get into in my life, we have a choice. That is one of the greatest things that God has given us. I set before you life and death. Choose life that you and your descendants might live. And maybe there's some people here today that you just need to make a choice. A choice that you're going to stop being bitter. A choice that you're going to stop looking back. A choice that you are not going to waste one more day of your life feeling sorry for yourself. A choice that you are going to get the happy habit. And you're going to get rid of the hurry habit. And you're going to learn how to manage your emotions and not let them manage you. I don't know how you are, but you know, I love progress and I love goals. And I love to grow and I love something to look forward to. And all this stuff doesn't bother me at all. It excites me. It excites me when God gives me a new challenge and I see something new that I can grow toward. So if you've been here this whole weekend and you feel like you got a, you got a problem with every single, single thing that I've said this weekend, don't be, don't go, oh my God, I never wish I would have gone. <laughs> Just say, I am so excited I can hardly stand it. God has opened my eyes and revealed so many things to me and I can't wait to start working with the Holy Spirit to see what He's going to do in my life. Amen? Self-pity. Elizabeth Elliot said, self-pity is a death and has no resurrection. A sinkhole from which no rescuing hand can drag you because you have chosen to sink into it. And do you know that self-pity is idolatry? It's turning inward and idolizing yourself. Everything becomes about how you feel and what people are doing to you and what they're not doing for you. And I'm just saying... Yes, I understand your situations, and I understand how emotions behave, and I understand that you probably have not been treated right by everybody, and I understand that life is not fair. I understand it all, but I'm just here to say that there's only one thing that moves the hand of God, and that's faith. It's not self-pity. So we have to have a positive attitude that God loves me and He is going to take care of me and no matter what anybody else does to me, God is my vindicator and He will work it out and make it right if I would trust Him. I hope I'm talking to some people, not just standing up here talking. Don't waste another day feeling sorry for yourself. I was stuck in self-pity. Could not make any progress. Self-pity is an ugly habit. This is something Joyce Meyer said. <laughs> Self-pity is an ugly habit. There's nothing more unattractive to look at or more unpleasant to be around than a person who's filled with self-pity. It is draining on everybody. Amen? No habit can be broken until you are no longer willing to let it control you. The best antidote for self-pity is refusing to sit by idly and feel sorry for yourself. Get up, get out of the house, go do something, get out in the sunshine, go for a walk, go look at something pretty, go look at nature, go help somebody else that's in worse condition than you are. Don't just sit there and sink into it. Get up. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you.
Amen. We've got a life to live and a world to save. We're not going to do it sitting around feeling sorry for ourselves and being bitter and resentful. Don't let your emotions control you. You can manage them. You have the power of the Holy Spirit to have emotions and not let them have you. You know, the reason why I say we can have emotional habits is because I had a habit of self-pity. I was addicted to self-pity. You can have mental habits. I had a habit of reasoning. I had to figure everything out before I could calm down and feel settled. I didn't know how to be happy and not know. I thought I had to know. Now I don't care. You know, I've had enough experience with God. I don't know what He's going to do. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> people ask me some of the most unique questions. You know, well, what, what's going to happen to the ministry after you're dead? Well, <laughs> first of all, I'm not that close to death that we've got to be thinking about that yet. And... Secondly, God is going to be God and do what He needs to do, and everything is going to work out fine. You know, I don't have to know. I don't, I don't have to have a 12-part plan for that. I'm just going to get up every day and, and trust God. I had, a, I had a, a habit of having to figure everything out, and I had to give it up. I, it was an addiction in my life, and I had to give it up and go through the agony of not knowing for a while to get to where I was happy. I had a habit of feeling sorry for myself. And every time something didn't go my way, immediately I could feel, oh. <laughs> and you can't break those habits until you're no longer willing to put up with them. I hope somebody's getting to the point where they're no, willing, no longer willing to put up with this stuff. All right, how about the emotion of anger? <laughs> I got some takers on that one, don't I? Well, you know, there's righteous anger and unrighteous anger. And there's a lot of things in the world that you ought to be mad about. Poverty is one of them. Sex trafficking is one of them. Little kids living on the street is one of them. And our response when we feel that kind of anger should be to go do something about it. There's an unrighteous kind of anger where you're always angry every time you're not getting treated right, every time people are not doing for you, talking to you right, looking at you right. That's an unrighteous anger. And even when people do mistreat you, the Bible says you're going to feel anger when you get mistreated, but you know what the Word says? Don't let the sun go down on your anger. It's easier if you get mad in the morning, you got all day to get over it. But it's tough if you get mad about bedtime, and then you've only got about 45 minutes to obey God. Well, I think about everything, you know, it's like... Let's look at Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. When you're angry, do not sin. So now that's saying that you can be angry, but not let your behavior get over into sinful behavior. So you can feel anger and keep your mouth shut. You can feel anger and not mistreat the person that you're angry at. Woohoo. I tell you what, you guys are going to be in such control over your emotions when this is over. Be angry and sin not. Don't ever let your wrath, your exasperation, your fury, or your indignation last until the sun goes down. Don't go to bed mad. God tells us not to do it. Leave no such room or foothold for the devil. Give him no opportunity. Come on, now let's read what that's saying. When we stay angry and refuse to forgive, refuse to make peace, refuse to pray it through, we, we are opening a door for the devil. No wonder we're doing ourselves a favor when we forgive. Bless yourself and don't go to bed mad. I'm sure you've maybe done what I used to do. I would go to bed mad at Dave and I would not touch him. 
I'm not touching you. I would sleep on the seam of the mattress to keep from touching him. And I would lay there, if he, had, if he had the cover, instead of saying, can I have some of the cover or pulling on the cover, I would, I would freeze all night rather than, I'm not talking to you, I'm not, a, well, he slept all night, woke up refreshed, and I was miserable, so who did my anger hurt? It didn't hurt him, it hurt me. <laughs> I think you guys are laughing too hard. I think you must recognize this stuff. You know, these are not just little nice scriptures that we read in church on Sunday to sound spiritual. Oh, yea, I say unto you, when you're angry, sin not. <laughs> verily, verily, don't ever let the sun go down on your anger. Yea, I say unto you, do not give the devil any foothold in your life. And everybody goes, amen, 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 amen. And then go home, the first thing that happens, get mad and stay mad all day. Come on, this stuff will save your life. If you learn how to do what this book says, the devil will not be able to control you. We got to apply it in our everyday life. Anger is danger. It's one letter away from danger. All you got to do is stick a D on the front of it and you got danger. Yeah, wow, wow. I'd like to say that I made that up, but I didn't, I read it. Okay, when people hurt you, the Bible promises us that God will vindicate us. God is your vindicator. He repays the people that hurt you. You don't have to. God does. He does not take it kindly when people hurt his kids. But God can't move if you don't do what he's told you to do, which is what? Pray for your enemies Bless them and do not curse them, and that means stop talking about them. <laughs> That's what it means. <laughs> That's what it means. To bless your enemies means to speak well of them. To curse them means to speak evil of them. So God wants us to even stop telling everybody, you will not believe what so-and-so did to me. Well, wait till I tell you they've done it again. Well, I tell you what, sister, I'm just not going to put up with that anymore. I want you to pray for them that they'll be nice to me. Why don't you ask them to pray for you? Why don't you ask them to pray for you that you can walk in love no matter what happens? <clears throat> Frequent anger places us under undue stress, and it is the root of many illnesses. Doctors from Coral Gables, Florida, compared the efficiency of the heart's pumping action in 18 men with coronary artery disease and in nine healthy controls. Each of the study participants underwent one physical stress test, riding an exercise bike, and three mental stress tests doing math problems in their head, recalling a recent incident that had made them very angry, and giving a short speech to defend themselves against a hypothetical charge of shoplifting. Using sophisticated x-ray techniques, the doctors took pictures of the subject's heart in action during these tests. For all the subjects, anger reduced the amount of blood that the heart pumped to body tissues more than any of the other tests. And this was especially true for those who had heart disease. The doctors administered the test, who administered the test commented, why anger is so much more potent than fear or mental stress is anybody's guess. But until we see more research on the subject, it couldn't hurt to count to 10 before you blow your stack. <laughs> well, God's version of don't blow your stack is hold your peace. Jesus gave us peace and God is saying, don't let yourself get in that condition it, it affects the way you act. It affects the way you talk. It does damage to your physical body. We need to learn how to manage that anger and not let it manage us. Amen. Amen. Man's anger does not promote the righteousness that God desires.
Emotional habits cause us to react in situations instead of acting on the Word of God. And emotions are strong. They're one of the strongest forces in the world. And the whole point of an emotion is for it to rise up and get you to follow it. But we need to get to the point where when emotions rise up, we control them. I always say wait for emotions to subside and then decide. You know how easy it is to get emotional about something and buy it? <gasps> oh. 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 You go in debt for it, put it on a charge card, make payments on it for a year, and you put it in a drawer somewhere and don't even know what you did with it. <laughs> All out of emotions. People get in debt out of emotions. They marry wrong people out of emotions. They don't stay married to right people out of emotions. Oh, come on, that was better than your acting. I imagine old Dave felt like leaving me a few times. But thank God he's still here. We react one way when we get upset. We react another way when we get discouraged. We react another way when we're hurt. And you know, we can just continue reacting, reacting, reacting. Or we can learn to not let our emotions manage us and rule us and have the upper hand over them. And if you need more help on that, I got a book on it. <laughs> living beyond your feelings, that's what it is. Yay, living beyond your feelings. Okay, third habit, the confidence habit. Oh, I'm happy to be talking about this one because I want you guys to go out of here today having made your mind up that you are a child of God, that He is in you, around you, for you, with you, that He has gifted you and equipped you to do whatever you need to do in life. I want you to hold your head up, get those shoulders back, walk tall, look people in the eye, and I don't care how you feel, you don't have to feel confident to be confident. Amen? Amen? You don't know how I always feel every time I come out here. I mean, there are times when I come out here and I don't even have a clue what the first word out of my mouth is going to be. Our confidence is in Christ. It's believing that He will not let us down. Many of you are not experiencing the great things in life that God has planned for you because you won't take that step of faith and you know where God meets you? When you step into it. You know when the waters parted? When they stepped into them. Not when they stood over here waiting for them to part. When they stepped in, the waters parted. Some of you need to step in and let God prove himself in your life. You need to step in and let God be God. Stop waiting for some feeling. Well, I just don't, I don't feel like I'm ready yet. Well, you know, it would be worse if you did feel ready than if you don't feel ready. Because if you feel ready, you may not depend on God. And if you don't feel ready, you're going, oh, my God, you got to help me. If you don't help me, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. Put no confidence in the flesh. Don't put your confidence in your education, who you know, who you don't know, the way you look or don't look, what side of the street you live on, what neighborhood you live in. Put your confidence in Christ. And I'm telling you what, there is nobody that he cannot promote and lift up if you have your confidence in him. I can tell you the absolute truth. By the world's standards, I am totally unqualified to do what I'm doing. I'm absolute truth. By the world's standards, I am totally, completely unqualified. And to be honest, it just makes them mad. Because I didn't do any of the stuff you're supposed to do to be able to do what I'm doing. Amen? Amen. Not qualified. But let me tell you something. God qualifies you. Amen. You're qualified because He has anointed you to do whatever you do. Amen. Don't discount yourself. Don't look at everybody else and think, oh, I wish, I wish, I wish. No, step in. 
Know that God loves you. You are precious to Him. You are valuable to Him. He has put His Son in you. You have capability. You have strength. You can do whatever you need to do in life through Christ who strengthens you. Galatians 5.16 says, But I say, walk and live habitually in the Holy Spirit, responsive to and controlled and guided by the Spirit, then you will certainly not gratify the cravings and the desires of the flesh. So I just want to encourage you that while you're farming new habits, it's important for you to stay positive and think about the good thing that you're trying to do instead of thinking about the bad habit that you're trying to break. We always have a tendency to focus on, I need to break this habit, I need to break this habit. But really what we should do is focus on the good thing that God is working in us. Be thankful, God, I thank you that you're working in me. Thank you that you're working this good thing in me and the good will force out the bad. Well, I'm standing in a doorway in Chiang Rai, Thailand, and through your partnership and support of this ministry, you are here with me. And what's happening here is girls who have been victims of sex trafficking, thank God, have been rescued, and now we're teaching them a trade. You know, it's so important to teach them a trade because if you don't, then they don't have many options except to go right back into the same kind of lifestyle. So thank you for sending us, and just remember, you're here today too.